we're going to start with this quote because I want to start with just laying some groundwork of really what is workshop and what is inquiry. Uh, we all have different background experiences, so it's nice to kind of have some uh, what I'll often call sunflower time for us to all sort of face the same direction and have a common ground that we can then build on together. So I love this quote. This is from an article from a few years ago by John Spencer. And he said, instead of thinking outside the box, innovation often involves thinking differently about the box. And I hope that this is the stance that we can take today when thinking about workshop and inquiry. Too often around the world when I'm visiting schools, there seems to be a lot of ideas that these are two very separate things and they're kind of living in two separate boxes. And I hope today we can sort of transform that thinking and see, wait a minute, maybe they're not in different boxes. Perhaps they live in the, in the same box. It's just all on how we look at it. So I'd like to start with what really is inquiry. Uh, we all have different background experiences, even with, within the IB on what inquiry might mean to each of us. What I've done here on this slide is really just lifted up the key points laid out in the enhanced PYP on this spirit of inquiry and what it really is. So you can just take a moment to look at the slide, see some of those big points. And what you'll notice first off there is, is why do we believe in inquiry is because it's beautiful learning. It's purposeful and it's authentic. It's true to how humans learn. If you think about yourself when you're learning something new, we're often looking up YouTube tutorials. Um, in fact, during this time of quarantine, I was just chatting with a friend earlier today and I was like, I think I need to start looking up like how to trim my own hair because I don't know when I'm finally gonna get to go to a stylist again. So when we need to learn something new, we inquire, that's what we do. We ask questions, we research, we study, um, we dig into it. It's true to how we learn and so we want kids to authentically experience that. It's also important to note that in the enhanced PYP, they use a really beautiful term for inquiry. They refer to it as an interplay. So too often, I think we have this misconception that it's this lockstep um, process um, of very rigid steps and that that is inquiry. But those of us who have lived it, all of you I'm sure, know that it's not that um, straightforward. It can kind of go all over the place. I often think of those like crime drama movies where it's um, they have the, the string theories that they're building. Often the inquiry interplay can look like that. So it has these big parts of reflection and action and inquiry, but they can go in different orders, they can overlap. Um, there's not just one way. And of course our big why is that it builds capacity in kids. We want kids who go on and learn for life. We want kids who can make their own empowered choices, who live out the IB mission of being open-minded and being uh, caring global citizens. And then in that final corner down there, you'll see the design of inquiry. Some of those things might feel very natural, like play, problem-based learning, but it's important to note that explicit teaching has a place too. And so part of what we'll talk about in the next few minutes is what is that place? How does explicit teaching fit into inquiry and how does the workshop model help us with that? So in a nutshell, what you see on the screen, this is really what inquiry is about and this is kind of our why for why we believe in it. So if that's inquiry, now we want to think, well, what about workshop and how might they live in the same box? So I want to start with non-examples. These are misconceptions that are often out there. Workshop is not a specific curriculum or a specific program. There are many popular programs and curriculum resources out there if you're using workshop. And I think because they're so popular, sometimes there's a misunderstanding that they're synonymous, like that's what workshop is. Um, many of those resources are beautiful and wonderful, but they in themselves are not workshop. You can totally create your own units and your own uh, design and still use the workshop model. It's not one specific curriculum or program. It's really built on theories that have, that have been around since the 1970s with people like Donald Graves and Donald Murray and then Nancy Atwell and Ralph Fletcher long before some of these published programs existed. And then it's also important to note, it's not the whole of literacy instruction. Workshop is a part of balanced literacy. And so you'll also have other important components like interactive read aloud, uh, word study, um, interactive writing, shared writing. Those are also a part of your balanced literacy program. But today we're going to zoom in on workshop. So that's what workshop is not. <laughs> what workshop is then is really a philosophy. Just like inquiry is a spirit, workshop is really a spirit too. And within that philosophy, there's a framework 
that is what makes the workshop model. That's why you'll even often hear it referred to as the workshop model, because it's really about this framework based on decades and decades of research of what helps readers and writers grow. So you'll see on your screen now a green box. If you think of whatever time you might have in your schedule with kids, uh, time that you have for reading or time that you have for writing, imagine that that window of time is this box. What the workshop framework really is about is about keeping the heart of that box, the center, focused on kids, focused on kids living the work. Um, too often in literature classes and reading classes and writing classes, kids are being talked to about reading and talked to about writing. But we know, of course, the way you're gonna get better at something is by doing it, by living it. And so the workshop model is really designed to help kids do just that. So in a standard workshop, framework, you would start with a mini lesson and you'll notice that it's usually just eight to 10 minutes. This is important because if we stretch it out super long, for one thing, every minute that we stretch it out is taking away from kids actually living the work, actually growing and experiencing reading and writing for themselves. Um, we also know, of course, that all of us as humans, um, it's, it's not really best practice for brain research to just stay for 40 minutes um, without any time to collaborate, to try, to do. So we're taking all that we know about best practice and saying, you know what, we're gonna zoom in on one clear inquiry question or that leads to one big idea or one clear teaching point in this mini lesson. Um, rather than trying to teach seven different things and really none of them are absorbed. So it's really focused, it's clear, we teach with uh, what we often refer to as brevity and clarity so that kids can then go off and try it out. So then after they've had a chance to try, we always wrap up with some share time. Uh, it's often about five-ish minutes. It kind of depends on what you're doing with kids, but that share time is really about bringing together community. It's a time to celebrate, it's a time to reflect, it's a time to set goals, to self-assess. Um, so you can probably already start to imagine how so many of our ATL skills are living inside here. Um, Self-management, communication, critical thinking. And then the bulk of the time, once again, is spent with kids actually reading and writing. That's important too. Um, sometimes we might even feel as teachers this tug of like, oh, so the kids are just reading. But there's no just. <laughs> reading is the most powerful work that they can do. And they're reading and writing with you there to give them expert feedback, to coach in, to write where they are and personalize their learning for them and help them go to the next step that they need. So what you see on the screen here, this is workshop. It's not a specific program. It's you knowing your kids and being responsive to them. It's lifting up um, almost like an invitation of what to think about as a reader and writer, and then them going off and living the work of reading and writing with you coaching in, sometimes one-on-one -on -one and one-on-one -on -one conversations, and other times pulling three or four kids together around a common goal and digging into that and inquiring into that with one another. So with that as the overall framework of workshop, we can already then start to imagine how this interplay of inquiry lives. It's not two different boxes, same box. Like throughout those different pieces of the framework, kids are asking questions. They're, they're acting, they're living the work, they're reflecting and thinking about next steps, sometimes on their own, sometimes with a reading and writing partner, sometimes with you. So workshop really is inquiry. It's the inquiry interplay and action. Of course, another big component of the PYP is agency. And in the enhanced PYP, agency is referred to as voice, choice, and ownership. A workshop classroom is so agency rich. We're always thinking, how can kids be responsible for their own learning today? Where are they able to make empowered choices? So in a workshop classroom, for example, when kids go off, they've had that mini lesson, and now they're going to go off to read. They're reading any book that they've chosen. Um, they, they get to make that choice. You know, what kind of book do they love or is there a certain author they love? They're getting to choose. It's not all of us going off and reading the exact same book because we're not all the same readers. We're not all the same people. Um, and then with writing, same, same kind of idea. They're usually going off and writing whatever they want. So we're not all writing about pollution or we're not all writing about our summer vacation. 
we're going off and making choices. Maybe in our recent mini lessons, we've been learning about what strong narrative writers do, and then we all get to go off and write our own story about whatever we want, transferring those concepts, those skills of a narrative writer. Or sometimes we're not even all writing narrative. We might be writing in any genre we want because our mini lessons have been about um, a craft move, like how authors use punctuation to show voice. And so we have like two weeks of mini lessons all about that. But when the kids go off to write, some might be writing a story, some might be writing an opinion piece, some might be writing whatever, <laughs> a how-to. Um, but all of them are practicing those moves they've been learning about showing voice with punctuation. So there are lots of options of how it can look, but the big idea is that kids are making choices and kids are showing their own voice and taking ownership. And of course, there's that share time where they're often setting their own reading goals, their own writing goals. Um, they're reflecting on what they've been learning. And then another big piece with agency is to think about the environment. Environment is super important in a workshop classroom, and it's super important to what we do in the PYP. It's important to what we do everywhere, <laughs> because as you might have heard as an educator, we often even say environment is the third teacher. Um, it really makes a huge difference. So in a workshop classroom, these four points you see on the screen, these are four big things that are really important based on what we know readers and writers need. One thing is, of course, access. Um, and so that first bit would be access to literature. Do we have a literature rich environment? Strong classroom libraries with diverse text where kids are seeing and learning about different cultures, different perspectives. You can see how that's important to them as readers, but also super important to our PYP goals of international mindedness and global citizenship. Um, it also needs to be accessible though in the sense of can kids easily get what they need and can they take agency to do that on their own? So that accessible and organized kind of go together in that sense. If I think back to when I was a student, I can for sure remember having classrooms where um, all of the good stuff, like the good markers, the paper, whatever, it was all locked away in either a teacher closet or a teacher zone in the room that no kid could go in. Um, that's, not, that's not the environment in a workshop classroom. In a workshop classroom, we're lifting up respect and trust for one another. So we're helping kids learn that ATL skill of self-management to be able to make principled, powerful choices. And this is important because if you remember that framework, the heart of workshop is conferring. And if some of you have tried it before, I know I had this experience when I first started workshop teaching. I was like going to confer with a kid or work with a small group. And right away, <laughs> two or three kids would come up and tap on the shoulder and have a question or wanna show me their paper under my nose. Um, and then I'm not getting any powerful conferring or small group work accomplished. So I'm really not able to do what's best for kids in that scenario. I'm also not helping kids be empowered to really harness their agency. So we want an accessible, organized environment so kids don't have to come to me. They can look within themselves and know, like, I got this. Um, for example, maybe their pencil breaks. <laughs> they don't have to come to me and announce that their pencil breaks or ask what to do. We lay in a workshop classroom really clear rituals and routines at, at the beginning, usually co-creating those together with kids so that we all have ownership. And so when that pencil breaks, the child just thinks to themselves, oh yeah, I know what to do. I'm gonna go over here, I'm gonna put it in the jar for unsharpened broken pencils, and then I'm gonna take a sharpened one out of the sharpened jar. And then I'm gonna get right back to my important writing. Like it just, it, that's what they do. And they know that's what they do. Or if they have to go to the bathroom, they know they don't have to come to tell you they know that they can go and grab the pass or sign out the clipboard, whatever routine that you put in place together as a class. Um, and this is from the very young to the older. We want to ensure that they know um, so that they can make empowered choices, so that they can feel confident. And when you think about that in a bigger picture, it might at first just sound like little things. But A, it of course helps our workshop run smoothly so that we can do what's best for kids. But beyond that, you know, if they're able to make a, an empowered choice about uh, going to the bathroom and getting a pencil, that's instilling already in them the confidence of, of that feeling of, I've got this. I don't have to go to someone else with every little thing. I can make responsible principled choices. And that transfers to so many other things later in life. 
And then of course we want it to be authentic. So you'll see this picture here. This is from a beautiful school in Singapore. Um, they have way more space in that room than unfortunately I did in both Bangkok and Japan uh, for years. But nevertheless, no matter how much space you have or how little space you have, the spirit of what you see in that classroom is really what we want for a workshop classroom um, because it's about agency. So when kids go off to read and write, they're harnessing those ATL skills of self-management reflection and they're thinking, where will I focus best? Where am I comfortable? Where do I do my best thinking? And you know, for some that's sitting at a table with a chair, for some that's laying on a sofa, but being able to try out different things and figure out what's working for them is super empowering. So really that's what workshop's about. It's about empowerment. And I believe that that's what our philosophy as IB teachers is really about too. At the end of the day, we want kids to be empowered to, to do wonderful things as humans for life. And specifically with literacy then in a workshop classroom, it's about being able to read and write well and loving it. And I think sometimes, again, with that idea of separate boxes instead of being in the same box, sometimes we can think like, oh, it's either or. Either we're gonna focus on helping them be skillful and do it well, or we're gonna focus on the love of it. And in a workshop classroom, we recognize it's not either or, it's an and both. Um, these things are not in conflict with one another. In fact, they form this cycle. Like when you're able to read and write well, you love it. And when you love it, you do more of it and you're able to do it well. And so they work together and that's really what workshop is about. And just a few more key things to lift up. One is at the heart of a workshop classroom is relationships first. This is everything. Um, you have to have this foundation with your kids. And so that research-based framework helps us do this. We're talking with our kids all the time in one-on-one in -on -one conversations and in small groups. And when we're able to do that, we're able to see them as individuals, as people. They know that, they feel that. We're listening to them, we're building goals with them. They're making choices, they're taking ownership. All of that is in line with what we believe in the IB of helping kids be empowered for life, helping them harness agency, but also this idea of we really wanna personalize. We wanna see um, their uniqueness as individuals. You know, If you think about that IB mission statement, that last line, which is probably my favorite part about um, recognizing that both people with different perspectives can both be right, right? So we want that open-mindedness and a part of being able to be open-minded is to build relational trust and to build relationships. So that is definitely key. And that framework gives us the space and the time to do that with kids. And so then we'll start to, to wrap up to move into questions with just thinking how all of this is not only in line with what we believe philosophically as inquiry educators, as PYP educators, but also what research tells us is best practice for literacy instruction. So from research, we know that these are the big three things after decades of studying meta analyses and seeing like what really seems to matter for kids. Again and again, it comes back to these three big things. First of all, they need time and too often that's missing too often. Again, we're just talking to kids about it instead of letting them live it and do it. Um, we get better at what we get time to practice and do. They also need access, so we want to have resources for both writing and books for reading readily available. Um, there's been many studies into classroom libraries and their impact on the amount of reading that kids do. So definitely make sure that kids have lots of access to text. And then, of course, they need you. They need you and your expert feedback. And so I do want to just wrap up with thinking about what that means, that idea of feedback to feed forward which is of course lifted up and then enhanced PYP. But one of my favorite ways to think about it is from John Hattie. Some of you might be familiar with his work. He's done a lot of research into feedback and he says the best feedback is just in time, just for me, just where I am in my learning process, just what I need to move forward, that personalization. So, just where I am and just what I need to move forward. Where am I going next? As workshop teachers, that's what we're always thinking. We have an assets-based philosophy where we're thinking, what are you already doing that I'm gonna complement and lift up? 
And then where might you go next? And just like a coach there showing them, oh, maybe you want to try this. You know, we're showing them new moves to try as readers and writers to grow and progress. And that's totally in line with the philosophy of the PYP. This goes back to that very first slide we looked at, explicit instruction, where is its place? Well, in an inquiry classroom, explicit teaching occurs just in time, not just in case. I keep this as a mantra kind of in my head when I'm teaching. Um, too often, the reason our lessons aren't many, the reasons our lessons might stretch for instead of you know 10 minutes, they end up being 20. <laughs> or 27 or more is because we're often thinking just in case. We're like, oh, but they might need this, they might need this, so just in case I'm gonna say this and say this. But in a workshop classroom and in an inquiry classroom, we recognize, no, we need to be just in time. We need to go back to what Hattie said about feedback, and I can be just in time in a conference or just in time with a purposefully um, planned small group. Rather than trying to give everyone everything just in case, then we're missing out on those ATL skills uh, of critical thinking and creative thinking. We want kids to have a chance to grapple, to be figuring out kind of people and to try things and see what works and doesn't work. Um, and then if they need our help, of course we're gonna be there just in time for them. But we wanna be careful not to over scaffold. And so the mini, the mini lesson and the workshop framework help us do that. So that's in a quick overview nutshell, some big ideas about inquiry and workshop. There are many more layers we could dig into, uh, but overall, just to say what workshop teaching really is, is it's personalized, it's timely, just in time, not just in case. It's all about empowerment and it is in itself inquiry, inquiry for kids and inquiry for us as teachers. So I'd love to see what kind of questions we have. I think we'll transfer over to um, some Q&A and see, yeah, lift up some questions from the group. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Tonya. That was uh, amazing. And I think, I think I saw in the chat, I could see a lot of people resonating with your ideas, with the intentionality of it. So, so, and we have a really, I think we have a diverse audience group today. So there's a lot of uh, teachers who just, uh, you know, who seem to be beginning into the workshop model, while there are some who are definitely more experienced and have more specific questions. Uh, we have a lot of questions that have come in. So I'm gonna start with the more like the more beginner questions and then we can dive into uh, the questions which are more specific and into the weeds right um so here i see um I, and i had actually prepared so many questions from our side just thinking that you know uh, if, if people don't ask questions but we have about 20 uh, 28 here and about three in the chat so uh, we'll just start to take these uh, right away right um so so one one specific uh one, one overall one was you know how does how does the workshop model fit into like the weekly schedule um and so so basically you know for a teacher that who's just starting out with the workshop model what are some strategies where does where does she start uh you know any tips and tricks for uh, for her yeah for sure um those are great questions so i think first of all as far as thinking over your week um, so much of that depends on context. That's something I've definitely learned with working with so many schools all over the world is there's not one way. And of course, that's true to our inquiry spirit too. So it's really going to depend on how much time is already in your schedule for literacy. Um, you know, that's going to be very different in um, just for, you know, in a U.S. public school, that could be quite different than an international school in Asia, for example. So you're probably going to have different amounts of time. Um, so if it's within your schedule, in many schools, we do reading and writing workshop every day. It's a part of our literacy block and it's a part of what we do. Sometimes if time is short, we do have to get creative with um, that structure a little bit in the sense of you might have um, one day a week, for example, that's what we call a repertoire day. And the idea of this would be um, that really all of workshop is repertoire work. So. Uh, when you do that mini lesson and you give a teaching point, what workshop is not is it's not going off and doing that assignment. Like whatever you just talked about in the mini lesson, not every reader is going to go off and do that thing. It's not an assignment. It's more of each day we're adding another layer of what a reader does when they study character, for example. So your mini lesson 
of every day that week might be about ways that readers analyze characters. And as kids go off, they might be applying what you just talked about, but some of them might be thinking about what you talked about on Wednesday because, that, because of where they're at in their book right now. And that's really what we want for kids at the end of the day is we don't want it to be, we talked about this today and so that's what I'm doing just today. And workshop, it's a forever stance. We want kids for life to walk away with these transferable skills that anytime they're reading about characters, they can pull on this whole toolbox of skills to use. Um, so with that in mind, you might have a day a week, that's a repertoire day where instead of a mini lesson, it's really a micro lesson. It's you just saying for like one minute, like, all right, readers, so we've been talking about a lot this week. Go ahead and take a look at the anchor chart behind us. Wow, look at all these things we've been talking about. Make a plan with your partner right now. What feels most important for you to focus on today? Um, and they, you know, take 30 seconds to make a plan. All right, off you go. and <laughs> go. Off you go to read um, so that they get that extra time to read. If you feel like your schedule's been short, um, you might build in a repertoire day where you're not doing a whole nother mini lesson. Um, and of course, some schools do have to have it where they're only doing it maybe four times a week instead of all five times or whatever because of those other balanced literacy components that we mentioned. We need to make sure we also have time for read aloud, um, for interactive writing, things like that. Uh, and most places we can make space for those in our day uh, morning meeting or right after recess or something like that. But for some, if that's not possible, you might have to get a little more flexible. So just know there's not one way. It's really about thinking. And, and the question was already um, really wise and that I believe the way you read the question is they were saying across their week. That's a really smart way to think, especially in international education. Um, where our kids, you know, have beautiful opportunities in lots of other languages and, and the arts and things like that. Um, you'll often be thinking across your week and just think to yourself, you can almost take that green box we looked at and think across my week is most of my time spent kids living the work. Yeah. If it's not, what might I adjust so that they have more time to live the work with me coaching in? And then the second little bit of your question then goes right into that of where might a teacher start? I'd say start with conferring. The most powerful work you do is conferring with kids. So, and when you, when you prioritize that, everything else in the framework has to happen because if you're prioritizing conferring, you're not gonna be talking at kids the whole literacy block. You can't, you have to meet with small groups and confer. So I'd say zoom in on making that a part of your regular habit it's gonna be what really moves kids forward because we're personalizing for them and it's gonna help some of those other things naturally fall into place. Great, uh, thank, thank you for that, Tanya. So there's uh, you know, a couple of people asking about the different models that exist. Uh, and, and so Marisol says, where can we learn more about the workshop model? And then uh, there's someone who says that their school uses, uh, uses Lucy Calkins' work and is trying to integrate those with units of inquiry. But many teachers are beginners to Lucy Calkins and need support in integrating the unit. Any, any suggestions uh, that that you would share with them uh, so so in general want to know you know what are the workshop models that exist uh, any any for them to look up to i know you said that it's not a packaged curriculum i know lucy calkins is very prescriptive so i wonder i wonder what your thoughts on that that are right um yeah so for sure first of all the resources from lucy calkins and teachers college are beautiful <laughs> i just want to say that they're they will help move your readers and writers forward in beautiful ways. However, um, they're never meant to be taken and just adopted. It's never adopt, it's adapt. And I think that's where a lot of the, like, because those books don't know your kids, um, you know, they don't know what, like, uh, a classroom with 80% cuttery kids needs, you know, you as their teacher who knows them personally does. So, and um, again, with our scheduling is different as well than probably the classrooms those were initially designed for. So we're taking that beautiful resource, but then thinking, how does this look for my kids in my context? Um, so it is important to adapt and be responsive to, to your unique um, situation. But that is one resource to go to. Um, there are many, many other um, great resources out there. One would be um, as far as ideas for mini lessons to kind of pull from that are really sound and strong. Um, Jennifer Saravallo has two beautiful books out there, the Reading Strategies book and the Writing Strategies book. And uh, 
they're just chock full of different strategies that we authentically use as readers and writers that you could turn into mini lessons or you could turn into small group work. They could even be teaching points in a one-on-one -on -one conference. It just kind of helps you fill yourself with an understanding of what are some powerful moves for reading and writing. Um, they're really big. They're filled with hundreds of different strategies. So definitely worth the investment. And um, those are a great go-to resource. I'd also lift up for the specific lens for us as PYP teachers. Um, there's a beautiful book by Debbie Miller called What's the Best That Could Happen? And it is all about really a focus on reading workshop, but the ideas are definitely transferable to writing workshop. And she lifts up, there's a great chapter, a section where she even shows like different ways that model could look as far as mini lesson work period share, how you can be flexible and adjust it for your kids, um, how to kind of make the workshop model work for you in your unique context. So that would be a really good one to go to. Um, with writing workshop, just to throw out a few other names, Ralph Fletcher, uh, so much wisdom when it comes to writing workshop. So I would definitely uh, read all of his books. You can't go wrong. They're beautiful. He has a really great one called Joy Write. Um, that is a, a pretty quick read and just it's so powerful. Um, and then um, if you teach with um, like maybe I know we're PYP here, but if you also work with some middle school students, um, Penny Kittle is a great resource. Also, um, Pernell Rip. Um, there are many that take a workshop approach, uh, but those would be a few, a few resources to get started. Um, and then also just checking out a lot of times um, the Heinemann podcast often will introduce you to new names to check out. You could kind of listen, but maybe what we could do is... Um, I could talk with um, you, Parita, and just send a list of some resources, but then I know you're gonna send some stuff out, like just some some top book choices, because there's a lot out there. Yeah, For sure, take. yeah, that, that, I think that would be very appreciated by everyone. Um, and, and people are asking, so Elizabeth asks, uh, where do I find Tonya's courses? Uh, so Tonya, do you wanna take that? <laughs> uh, our, our courses, is that what, was that the question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I don't know if you have courses. I know that you do uh, Erin Kent uh, consulting. And so I don't know if you have pre-recorded courses that exist apart from this one, but that would be great. That would be great for them to know. For sure. Yeah. Um, so, and I think we have some people, I'm not able to, to keep up with that. There's so much going on in the chat. It looks awesome. But, but I know we have some, some people in here who were in some of our courses. So hopefully they can share some of their thinking with that. But if you go to Erin Kent Consulting, Dot com, um, you'll see there's a little tab for online learning. And right now our courses are of course online due to the um, situation with the pandemic. Right now we have several um, synchronous, so like live interactive courses offered this summer. Uh, we have a few coming up. I do have one more run of amplifying the PYP through workshop coming up this month, towards the end of this month. So you can still sign up for that if you want. Just go to the website and reach out through there. Um, and it's a five session course. So it's a 10 hour course, just digging really deep into, into all of this stuff. Um, and then we are planning to start making some of them asynchronous as well. So right now they're just live and interactive, but some asynchronous stuff is coming for when people are in the fall, when people are back at school and kind of might not have the, the summer time that some of us have now. Yeah. So erinkentconsulting.com is, is a place to go to just and click on that online learning tab. Yeah. And thanks for asking too. Great. So um, another question by Blessy um, is that, you know, how similar or different would the workshop model look in an early years, like a three to four years old classroom? Uh, if it includes all of the components of the workshops, how would the time allotment uh, probably vary? And a related question uh, from Kanchan is, how do you set up rich interaction between play and literacy? I think that's very early years focus too. So I think you can take both of those together. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I would say the spirit, you know, we talked about the spirit of inquiry um, at the beginning of today's session and the spirit of workshop is very much still alive in uh, a play based early years classroom. So by that, I mean the spirit of relationships first, the spirit of inquiry and asking questions, the spirit of personalization, um, the spirit of conferring with kids. It just, it just looks a little different um, 
in its flow, especially in the very early years. So if we're talking, um, you know, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, we take much more of a um, story workshop approach. So if you work with the early years, I definitely recommend looking into story workshop. Um, Opal School has done a lot of great work with that. And um, there's also a great book out there, I believe it's called Story Making, that kind of takes that sort of makerspace philosophy, but to storytelling. And Story Workshop is really the precursor to writing workshop. Um, and it's all about play. So it's about hands-on taking materials and playing with them and seeing how stories are everywhere. Um, so maybe I'm playing with clay and I'm, and I'm start telling a story about how, you know, this little guy meets this guy and they're on a farm or whatever. I'm storytelling, like the world is alive with stories. Um, and then that starts to build, that story workshop spirit um, starts to build as they're making that transition to kindergarten and perhaps more of a traditional workshop approach. Um, I know in some classrooms where they, they already are well grounded in story workshop and that translates to them taking that story to their writing. Um, for example, there was one little boy in a classroom who you know, wasn't sure what to write. And so he knew if he wasn't sure that maybe he needed to go and create some stories first with materials, that that's what we do, which is that story workshop approach. And so it was something very simple. He was looking at paper and there was like black paper and red paper. And all of a sudden he was like, oh, I know what I'm gonna tell my story about. It's gonna be about the day that black and red were at school and they met each other and became best friends. I mean, kids are great. You know, he had this whole story about, and then he went and started writing it. So um, it's just this idea of helping them see themselves as writers, as storytellers. Um, there's much more to it than just that, of course, but in a nutshell, it's, it's taking and actually creating things. So oftentimes there'll be a story workshop approach that is alive in our early years classroom because really we're playing through storytelling. Um, and then conferring is very alive too. It just might look a little different. So based on the stages of play and, and how students develop, um, often as teachers, we're really being sort of um, co-players with them. So the very first conferences you're having with kids, often, for example, you might just be a partner with them in their reading. You're just talking with them as they look at the book and they're just telling you, you know, this story that they know and love well. You're more of a proficient partner. And then as they start to transition into kindergarten, you're, um, you might just give like a compliment conference, just lifting up what they're doing well. So um, those relationships are still there, but it just doesn't always follow the exact same, uh, same format. Um, and then, and then, of course, with play, it depends on what kind of context you're in. Uh, in Montessori, for example, you know, they have um, uninterrupted play time. So it would be, you might, you're still conferring with kids, and sometimes that's as a partner in their play, but perhaps, you know, you're going and conferring with the kids who, who are going to the reading area, or who are in the writing area. Um, so th there's a little more um, openness in that sense. It is different. Um, to, to sum it up, it is different. We don't want to say, I mean, three-year-olds shouldn't be doing the same thing that seven-year-olds are doing because they're not seven, they're three. So we want to we wanna take what we know about what's developmentally appropriate and, and lean into that and remember that play is powerful. However, that spirit of personalizing for kids, that spirit of helping kids see themselves as readers and writers and thinkers and storytellers, that's all still there. It's just alive inside the play. Um, yeah, and look into story workshop. That'd be a great, a great go-to. Great. So before we dive into like the world of virtual learning questions that are here, uh, I'm going to one last, uh, you know, big question uh, is is uh, by Van and by Kanchan, and uh, the, it's uh, the similar question. What do you, uh, what do you do reading and uh, uh, would you do reading and writing workshops at the same time? And should the workshops be aligned to units of inquiry, mentor text? that are related to a TD theme and Kanchan asks how would you incorporate it into your unit of inquiry uh, lessons yeah yeah um so so the can so the first question just being about um well I guess we could we could go different directions in answering that question I know the last bit was specifically about um putting it together yeah. with your unit of inquiry, your transdisciplinary unit. So one thing would be absolutely, there are, are great ways to do that. However, we wanna remember as we always do within the PYP, 
that it's all about authentic connections. Um, so, and remembering that there are three big types of inquiry that you might be doing um, in, within the PYP. One would be, of course, your transdisciplinary inquiry, um, but there's also subject specific inquiry and there is a time and place for that. And then there's, of course, um, this idea of what we often call staggered timing, where you're kind of doing a blend of both. And when it comes to bringing together workshop and transdisciplinary units of inquiry, uh, it can often be helpful to think about that staggered timing. And really it's to help better accomplish what, what we want within the PYP, our core values. One key one being agency. So too often what I see happening around the world is when we try to just sort of quickly for lack of a better word, smush it together, um, we end up with a, a lot of agency being lost and a lot of the heart of workshop being lost because kids are often being told, okay, like we're all going to research um, the environmental dangers of plastic or whatever. Like everyone starts researching the same thing and we're all writing a paper on that or we're all going to do an opinion piece on global warming or whatever. Um, and that's really taking away the agency of, of choosing. I want to show my transferable skills of what an opinion writer does, but getting to choose what do I feel passionate about. Um, so often that staggered timing can help. Also, what's missing is we haven't taught kids the skills of opinion writers. We're just expecting them to show us like they should just know and, and do it. Um, but really, that, that's a, there's skills there that they need to learn so that they can make empowered choices. So if you stagger the timing, you could have some time in writing workshop where you're first taking maybe two weeks to just learn what are some moves that opinion writers use. Um, and they're going off to try out those moves in any topic of their choice, you know, whatever they're passionate about. Maybe they have a strong opinion on why Minecraft is the best game ever. Great. You can show off your skills, write all about that, um, and show off these skills you've been learning. And that gives them a chance to practice these new skills with a topic they know and love. Then you can take it and transfer it um, to the transdisciplinary unit. Maybe, maybe you've been doing that in writing workshop and in the transdisciplinary unit, you've been learning about global warming and doing some provocations and things like that. And now you can say, hey, you know, we've been talking a lot about global warming. How might we use these skills that we've been learning as opinion writers to help us communicate that learning and let them make that. And then they can write about that because they've had a chance to really try it out with topics of their choice. So that's just one example, but thinking about that idea of staggered timing um, can be really powerful. We can't expect kids to go transdisciplinary if they don't even know the disciplinary, like you can't connect what's not there. So we wanna make sure they do have um, strong, what's in the IB often called disciplinary grounding. Um, and then I think another question was reading and writing workshop at the same time, or how might that look? Yeah. That really depends on um, how much, again, your context and how much time you have. So for schools that uh, are gifted with a, a nice, big, juicy literacy block, you could often be doing both at the same time every day. Um, for some, they have to get a, a little more creative and will often do bends, um, where one is more reading heavy and one is more writing heavy, and you kind of go back and forth perhaps every two weeks or so. However, an important thing to note with that, and that's just scratching the surface um, as far as how exactly it would look, but just to note that it's reading heavy, but it's still writing light, or it's writing heavy, but it's still reading light. It doesn't mean you're only writing for two weeks or only reading because it's so important that kids read and write every day. Um, they need to be practicing and living that work every day. It's just that we're often thinking, I might not be doing reading mini lessons every day. Um, I might focus more heavily in my mini lessons on one or the other, but kids are still getting that time um, to do both. Um, but you know, if you only have 50 minutes a day for literacy, you're not gonna do like, like it wouldn't be recommended to do like a 20 minute reading workshop and a 20 minute writing workshop because then kids aren't getting that work time to live the work. So that's why you might focus where you still just do one mini lesson, um, like an eight minute mini lesson on reading skills that week and kids go off and try it out in their reading for 20 minutes and then do like 15 minutes of independent writing afterwards um, without a separate writing mini lesson. And then you kind of flip that like the next two weeks or something. Um, so yeah, you have to get a little creative if time is crunched. Yeah, and I think just just 
just the fact that like you said like be practical about it and like give children the time to be readers and what i love about readers and writers workshop is like give them the time to be readers and give them the time to be writers right which is which is so important um so there is you know let's dive into remote learning because most of the questions here are remote learning um and so uh, ronda asks how can you establish routines for writers and readers workshop if you are teaching remotely from the first day of school mm. Yeah, so I think, you know, I think that heart is still the same. We're still going to keep relationships at the center, and we're still going to keep that idea of an agentic environment at the center, except recognizing that now our environment is a Google Meet or a Zoom room <laughs> instead of our classroom. So perhaps the rituals and routines that we need to, to zoom in on and create at the beginning might look a little bit, a little differently. Um, we might be, depending on our kids' background experiences, you know, we might be going over like how to use the hand raise feature or how to whatever, but giving kids a way to um, inquire into that together, maybe try it, maybe they're going to have, um, you know, you watch a, a fun um, clip about like growing as a community or you do a little team building exercise or something, you know, not forgetting relationships. Um, I would say start the year knowing that, that it's always relationships first, whether we're in person or whether we're online. So those rituals and routines need to be grounded in getting to know one another and respecting one another. So whatever you have planned to do, ways to kind of talk to each other and get to know each other when there are times that are synchronous, not, not everything you do online will be synchronous, of course, but when you're coming together as a community, um, building in those routines of, you know, how do we talk to each other in this space? And you have to decide, right, what's going to work for, for your context. And depending on the age, you often, um, or not even age, even the, the youngest kids can do this, but depending on your community and your context, you know, having them help you build those together of like, um, do we do the raise hand feature or do we, um, do, do we lift up for each other? Like, oh, I think Parita has, might have something to say. Like, what are those conversation moves when we are in a Google Meet together? Um, what do we do when we're in breakout rooms together? Like, I think the, the process is still the same. It's just what we're talking about is different. Um, and then I'd say, like, leverage, even though we all, of course, miss being with our kids, leverage the silver linings that, um, that, being online can can give you for some of us it actually opens up more time for small group work and more time for one-on-one -on -one conversations so um you might record some mini lessons and have them as a menu that kids can choose from and can do asynchronously but then you're setting up you have some office hours that they can pop into for one-on-one -on -one conferences or you make some appointments for small groups around common goals um, and I think through living that work, you're also, of course, going to, again, talk about the rituals and routines of how we, how we treat each other in this space. What are the expectations? You know, and some of those things, I don't know, like if, if we are, if we are doing a, a synchronous class meeting, like what happens if they have to go to the bathroom? You know, do they need to tell you or can they just turn their camera off and go and turn it back on when they're back? Like, instead of talking about getting the bathroom pass, we're doing the same thing to, to give them agency because I think most would say they don't need to tell me like because I don't want them interrupting if I was just talking with another kid just like in a real classroom but I need to make sure that they're very clear on what they need to do instead and what they can do on their own um, making their own responsible choices yeah 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 no uh, and and you know so Ali Ali had a similar question any recommendations for like how to do this online but I think uh, I, you already answered that um, there's uh, Tanu asks this and there are a few questions around this uh, is how, how can we make uh, the environment agentic when it's virtual? Um, you know, how do you make resources available? You mentioned doing, um, you know, uh, 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 doing mini lessons that are pre-recorded with a sort of choice board and then maybe doing office hours uh, for con uh, conferring uh, with the, uh, for conferencing. So is there, you know, any, any other, any other ideas for, um, yeah making yeah. it i mean i guess kind of just a extra little layer it, it kind of goes along in that same line but you know for sure it can just be office hours and that in itself gives them some choice as far as the timing and and them kind of using self-management skills to think like oh i need to go meet today or i'm doing this with my writing or what have you but also you know in addition to that um 
just like a menu with many lessons, you can give a menu of small group options and they sign up, you know, whether it's on a Google Doc or on a Padlet or something, and they sign up for the one that they think they need the most. Um, and that's how, that's how you know who to send that appointment to. Now, of course, some, there's balance in everything. There are also some small groups that you're going to want to pull together because you see a common need and you can let them know, hey, you know, I've brought you three together because I noticed you're all reading historical fiction books and, and I thought we could really dig into this new thing together. Um, uh, but there can also be lots of space for kids choosing some small group goals and, you know, signing up. Um, and then while this isn't directly tied to agencies specifically is the question, I think um, it, it helps build to that in the sense of building relationships. I will say, you know, the start of the year in a virtual environment when we're kind of, and it's, it's new to all of us. Um, so we're all kind of like, I don't know, but we're going to try our best and we're going to be inquirers and risk takers and try some things. Um, I will say what we do know about kids and about all humans is that the social element is really powerful and really important. So I think lean into that um, and get relationships strong. So it, it'd be great to do book clubs. Um, and maybe as with other things with choices, maybe you give several options and you have kids like let you know there, maybe there are six options and kids let you know their top three and you tell them you're gonna make sure they get one of their top three choices, you know? So you book talk each book and they, you know, submit their top three choices. And then that way um, you can ensure that they get in a book club that's a good fit for them, social, emotionally, academically, all of that, but also they get some choice too. You know, they, they gave you their top three of ones they're really interested in. And then you're able to build some community from the start, their social interaction. Um, so it's help, It's giving them some agency in their choice, but also grounding in relationships um, and interest. Yeah. yeah, yeah, lots of lots of love for the book club idea. Uh, just helps build community. Uh, so I book clubs, right? And kids are people too, you know, it's fun and it should be fun and joyful. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think uh, we, we, we can take one or two last questions. Um, there's one question which is around differentiation strategies uh, for reading and writing. Um, I thought that was interesting, uh, especially from a virtual learning standpoint and otherwise there's questions for both right now. Yeah, so the question was, can you suggest any differentiation, uh, differentiation strategies for online reading and writing sessions? Hmm. Yeah, so I mean, I think I think just recognizing one part, a uh, beginning part would be that, of course, like online is not the same as the physical classroom, right? So um, we're not going to spend all of our time as, as a whole group. We're going to have some times where we are. Maybe you're giving a read aloud or giving a book talk um, or just coming together for morning meeting. You know, we do want to keep a community alive. So there is time and space for some synchronous everyone together meeting. But we also know that we're not gonna expect our kids to do that for seven hours, even though in person they'd be in the classroom perhaps for seven hours, but not in a Zoom room or a Google Meet. So um, just seeing that it is different things and honoring that can often open up more space for differentiation. Um, so because then you are able to meet with certain small groups online, just them. Um, you are able to offer some menu of choices of different options for kids that they can choose from and also able to send kids some different options of, hey, I think, you know, take a look at this and, you know, watch this and then we're going to talk tomorrow, like you and I one-on-one -on -one about it or something, if you know there's a certain skill they really need to work on. Um, and that's the most powerful differentiation you can do is being able to meet with a kid one-on-one -on -one and personalize your feedback and your conversation with them. A few differences as far as um, online, one big difference would be with writing workshop. Most are finding it's very helpful, um, and this could be done through Seesaw, this could be done through posting things on a Padlet, whatever, but um, being able to see the student's writing ahead of time to familiarize yourself with it. So um, while we would often do that physically as well, it feels even more important um, in a virtual setting. Um, because not all teachers, you know, it really depends on what tech you have, but it can be kind of hard to talk about the writing if it's like in their notebook and they're like holding it and you can't see it through your camera. So if they've already taken pictures of it and put that on Seesaw or whatever, 
um, then you know exactly what to talk about and, and you already have it so that then you could, if you had an iPad or something, you could project that up and kind of show them the part you loved most and compliment them on what they're really doing well and then teach into a tip that you think might help them next. Of course, if you don't have that tech, you can just hold up, you know, things like we work with what we have, but um, that would be one thing is, is when it comes to differentiating and really personalizing feedback with kids, it feels even more important um, to have seen their writing. So we're really able to give thoughtful feedback to that because we're not sitting side by side with them looking at their notebook the way we would be in a classroom. Um, and then though this is a side thing, just because I mentioned that, I wanna make sure there are no misconceptions. With reading, it is a little bit different and you don't need to feel like you need to have read every book. Um, when giving a reading conference, it's not about the book, it's about the thinking. So what you do want to know is what's the progression of, of thinking um, for reading and, and the grade level you're working on. Like if we're thinking about theme, how do readers progress in thinking about theme? So that if you ask a question about theme, depending on what they say back, um, you know where you might take them next. You know kind of what they're doing and not doing. So it's really about the skills and the concepts, not about the text in general. So um, since I mentioned looking at their writing, I didn't want people to think, wait a minute, but how do I read every book? You don't need to read every book. It's about um, the thinking and the analysis and um, rather than the actual book itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, uh, Nita here says that you can also use screencasts to give feedback. I know that a lot of uh, total partner schools uh, use the, uh, you know, the, the discussion feature where they initiate small group discussions so they can have, um, you know, three or four students discussing one particular book, even doing book clubs virtually uh, in that way is, is really exciting uh, for a lot of schools. So there's all of these possibilities. I think, uh, Tonya, you've really opened uh, the world for, for everybody who attended today. Uh, we had over 400 150 people who joined in from all over the world. So thank you so much for everybody who is not, um, you know, on Total Community yet. I would highly recommend joining that. Uh, there's a lot of authentic workshop activities in there. So there's readers and writers workshops, lots of things that you can um, bookmark and use right away in your classrooms. So do go to www.totalapp.com slash community. Um, and I think that's it for now. Thank you, Donia, once again for doing this. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us from all over the world. Uh, good night, good morning, good afternoon to wherever you are, and we'll see you very soon at the next Auto Talks.